the really interesting thing about the new chemical substances, the new mind-changing drugs, is this, that whereas, uh, if you look back into history, it's clear that man has always uh, had a, a hankering after mind-changing chemicals. He has always desired to take holidays from himself. Uh, but the, uh, and this is a, the most extraordinary fact of all, is that every naturally occurring stimulant, narcotic, sedative, or hallucinogen was discovered uh, in before the dawn of history. I don't think uh, there is one single one of these naturally occurring ones which um, modern science has discovered. Modern science, of course, has discovered better ways of extracting the active principles from these drugs and, of course, has discovered numerous uh, ways of synthesizing new substances of extreme power. But the, uh, the actual discovery of these naturally occurring things was made by primitive men, goodness knows how many centuries ago. Uh, there is, for example, in the, uh, underneath the uh, lake dwellings, uh, the uh, early Neolithic lake, lake dwellings which have been dug up in, the, uh, in Switzerland, we find poppy heads which looks as though people were already using this most ancient and powerful and most dangerous of narcotics, uh, even in the days before the rise of agriculture, so that man was apparently a dope egg addict before he was a farmer, which is a, <laughs> a, a, a very, very curious comment on human nature. Uh, but um, the difference, as I say, between the ancient mind changers, the traditional mind changers, and these new substances is that uh, they were extremely harmful, and the new ones are not. I mean, even the permissible mind changer, alcohol is not entirely harmless, as people may have noticed, uh, and uh, the, um, the other ones, the non-permissible ones, such as opium and cocaine, uh, opium and all its derivatives are very harmful indeed. Uh, they they rapidly produce addiction and uh, and uh, in some cases uh, lead at an extraordinary rate to uh, physical degeneration and death. Um, whereas these these new substances, uh, this is really very extraordinary they, that a number of these new mind changing substances uh, can produce enormous revolutions within the mental side of our being, and yet uh, do almost nothing to the physiological side. I mean, you can have a, an enormous um, revolution, for example, with uh, LSD-25 or with uh, the newly synthesized drug uh, psilocybin, which is the active principle of the Mexican sacred mushroom. Uh, you can have this enormous uh, mental revolution with no more physiological revolution than you would get from drinking two cocktails. Uh, and, and this is a really a most extraordinary fact. And uh, uh, it is, of course, true that uh, pharmacologists are producing a great many wonder drugs which, uh, where the cure is almost worse than the disease. Uh, every uh, new edition of medical textbooks contains a a longer and longer chapter on what are called iatrogenic diseases, that is to say, diseases caused by doctors. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and this is quite true, uh, that many of the wonder drugs are uh, extremely dangerous. I mean, they, they can produce extraordinary effects, and in critical conditions they should certainly be used, but they should be used with the utmost caution. But there, there is a, evidently a whole class of drugs affecting the uh, central nervous system which can produce enormous uh, changes in, uh, in sedation, in euphoria, in uh, energizing the whole mental process uh, without uh, doing any perceptible harm to the body. And in this sense, uh, this represents, it seems to me, the most extraordinary Revolution that it's it, uh, in the hands of a uh, of a dictator. Or, uh, these substances of one kind or another could be uh, used uh, in the most um, 
Well, with complete, uh, first of all, with with complete harmlessness, uh, and uh, the result would be that, uh, uh, I mean, you can imagine a, a euphoric which would make people thoroughly happy even in the most abominable circumstances. I mean, they, these things are possible. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. I mean, after all, this has even been true with the crude oil drugs. I mean, as a houseman years ago remarked, uh, apropos of Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, he says, uh, and beer does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to men. Uh, and beer is, of course, an extremely crude drug uh, compared with these ones. And uh, you can certainly say that some of the psychic energizers and the new hallucinants can do incomparably more than Milton and all the theologians combined could possibly do to make uh, the terrifying mystery of our existence seem more tolerable than it does. Uh, so that here, I think, one has a, a, an enormous uh, area in which the, uh, the ultimate revolution could function very well indeed, uh, an area in which uh, a great deal of control could be used by, not through terror, but through making life seem much more enjoyable than it normally does, uh, enjoyable to the point where, as I have said before, uh, human beings uh, come to love a state of things which by any reasonable and decent human standard they ought not to love. And this, I think, uh, is perfectly possible. Well, then, uh, very briefly, let me speak about uh, one of the more recent uh, developments of uh, uh, in the sphere of, uh, of neurology, the, uh, the implantation of uh, electrodes in the brain. Uh, this, of course, has been done on a large scale in, uh, in animals, and in, uh, in a few cases it's uh, been done in hopeless um, cases of the hopelessly insane. Uh, and it is anybody who's uh, watched uh, the behavior of rats with the electrodes planted in different centers, uh, must uh, come away from this experience with the most extraordinary doubts about what on earth is in store for us if ever this is got hold of by a dictator. If uh, the uh, I saw not long ago some rats uh, in Magoon's laboratory at UCLA, uh, there were two sets of them, one with electrodes planted in a pleasure center. And these rats were, the, the technique was that they had a bar which they pressed uh, and which um, turned on a very small current for a short space of time, which uh, we had a wire connected with their electrode and which um, stimulated this pleasure center, which was evidently absolutely ecstatic, was these rats were were pressing the bar 18,000 times a day. <laughs> and, uh, apparently, if you kept them from pressing the bar for a day, they would press the bar 36,000 times on the following day and would fall till they fell down in complete exhaustion. <laughs> uh, and they would neither eat nor be interested in the, uh, the opposite sex and would just go on pressing this bar. Uh, then the most extraordinary rats were those where the electrode was planted halfway between a pleasure and a pain center, and where evidently the the result was a kind of mixture of the most wonderful ecstasy in being on the rack at the same time. <laughs> and you, you would see the rats sort of looking at its bar and sort of saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> and finally would approach and do it. And then it would... <laughs> Go back uh, with this awful, uh, I mean, the, uh, if one can humanize or uh, anthropomorphize, I mean, he was feeling something terribly mixed. And he would wait for quite a long time before pressing the bar again, but he would always press it again. I mean, <laughs> this was the, the extraordinary thing. And the, in the, I notice in this um, most recent issue of the Scientific American, there's a very interesting article on electrodes in the brains of chickens. Uh, where the, the technique is, is very ingenious. You, you sink into their brains a little um, socket with a, with a screw on it, and the electrode then can be screwed deeper and deeper into the brain stem, 
and you can test at any moment, according to the depth of it, which goes in fractions of a millimeter, of what you're stimulating. And, and these creatures are not merely uh, stimulated by wire. They are fitted with a, a miniaturized radio receiver weighing less than an ounce, which is attached to them, so that they can be communicated with at a distance. I mean, they can run about in the barnyard, and you can press the button. And uh, the, this particular area of the brain to which the electrode has been screwed down to will be stimulated, and <clears throat> you will get these uh, fantastic phenomena that a, uh, a sleepy chicken will suddenly get up and rush about, or a, uh, an active chicken will suddenly sit down and go to sleep, or a hen will suddenly start sitting as though it were, uh, were hatching out an egg, uh, or a rooster will start fighting, or will suddenly go into a state of extreme depression. Uh, the uh, the whole picture of the absolute control of the drives is a, uh, is terrifying, and uh, in the cases, the few cases in which this has been done with very sick human beings, uh, the effects are evidently very remarkable too. I was talking last summer to uh, in England to Gray Walter, who is the um, most eminent exponent of the electroencephalogram techniques in England, and he was telling me that they, he's seen hopeless uh, inmates of asylums with these things in, in their heads, and that uh, these people were suffering from uh, uncontrollable depression. And they were, they'd had a, the electrodes inserted into something resembling, evidently, the pleasure center of the rat. Uh, anyhow, when they felt too bad, they just pressed a button and the battery in their pocket. And he said the result was fantastic. The mouth would go down would suddenly turn up, and they would evidently feel, for, I don't know for how long at a time, very cheerful and happy. So that <clears throat> here again one sees uh, the most uh, uh, extraordinary uh, revolutionary techniques uh, which are now available uh, to us. Now, the, uh, I think uh, the, what is obviously perfectly clear is that the, for the present, these techniques are not being much used except in a purely experimental way. But uh, I think it is extraordinarily important uh, for us to realize, first of all, to, uh, to realize what is happening to make ourselves acquainted with what has already happened, and then to use a certain amount of, of, of imagination to extrapolate into the future the sort of things that might happen. I mean, what might happen if, uh, if these fantastically powerful techniques uh, were used by unscrupulous uh, people in authority? What on earth would would happen? Well, what sort of society would we get? And uh, I think this is peculiarly important uh, because as one sees in looking back over history, we have allowed in the past all those advances in technology which have profoundly changed uh, a social and individual life, we've allowed them to take us by surprise. I mean, it seems to me that uh, during the late 18th century and early 19th century, when the uh, new machines were making possible the factory system, it was not beyond the wit of man to see what, the, uh, to look at what was happening and to project into the future, and maybe to forestall the uh, really dreadful consequences which uh, plagued uh, England and most of Western Europe and most of this country. Uh, for about 50 or 60 years, the, uh, the horrible abuses of the factory system. I mean, if uh, a certain amount of forethought had been devoted to the problem at that time, if people had, first of all, found out what was happening and then used their imagination to see what might happen, and then had gone on to work out means by which the worst uh, applications of the new techniques should not take place, well, then I think uh, Western humanity might have been spared about three generations of utter misery which was imposed upon the poor at that time. And uh, similarly with the various uh, technological advances now, I mean, it's quite clear we have to start thinking very, very hard about the problems of automation. 
uh, and again, I think we have to think still more profoundly about the problems which may arise in relation to these new techniques, which may contribute uh, to the this ultimate revolution. Our business is to, first of all, as, as I say, to, to be aware of what is happening, then to use our imaginations to see what might happen, how this might be abused, and then, if possible, to see uh, that the enormous powers which we now possess, thanks to these um, uh, scientific and technological advances, uh, shall be used for the benefit of human beings and not for their ultimate degradation. Thank you. <laughs> question shows a certain optimism which may not be justified. In a way, your quote from Hausmann that malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man uh, indicates that my remarks may show that I'm looking into the pewter pot to see the world as the world is not. At any rate, uh, I'm a bit worried about your picture or the picture you paint that the future may contain a number of monolithic scientific dictatorships, that there may be a groundswell in this, di in this direction, a groundswell uh, caused by the human tendency to seek pleasure where it can be found. But I'm struck by the fact that movements of that sort are always far more complex than any of our attempts at characterizing them. And I think that perhaps in this complexity is, lies a ray of hope that the future may not contain such monolithic scientific dictatorships and that the developments which we can expect in light of the various technological uh, achievements you mentioned may not lead in the direction of scientific dictatorships in the way you indicate. Now, this may depend to a great extent upon the nature or the characteristics of the nations in which these uh, results are first introduced. In other words, my question really is, when you project into the future and you say that the chances are very great of dictatorships of this kind occurring, could you qualify a bit more uh, what the chances are? Well, I, I, I say these, I don't think the chances are very great. I think they are there. And uh, I would think that one of the reasons why we may get more dictatorships than we like uh, lies... Uh, in a, quite a different field. I mean, with the uh, with large parts of the world increasing at 3% per annum in the population, uh, goodness knows what is going to happen. I mean, for example, uh, I was in India last uh, autumn, uh, and of course the, this is unutterably depressing, the in, enormous poverty, and the, the depression uh, grew a great deal uh, with the announcement just when we were there that the United Nations had come to the conclusion that its earlier estimates of the uh, increase of the Indian population were very much too low. Uh, the estimates uh, had been in the neighborhood of 1.7% per annum, which is about the same as the United States, which had to be corrected up to 2.2 or 2.3, which uh, I think doubles the population in about 32 years. And, of course, there are large parts of the world where the increase is uh, fully 3%, and in certain parts of the world, even 4%. I mean, 3% doubles the population in 24 years, and 4%, I forget, in about 16, I think. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the danger in regard to dictatorship uh, arises with the as the population presses more heavily upon resources, and as the rising tide of expectation, which certainly exists in these underdeveloped countries, uh, is frustrated, as uh, undoubtedly it is going to be, because it's, it is almost impossible to uh, make any development which shall catch up with, much less go faster than the, than the population increase. Uh, so we may get a great deal of social unrest, uh, and of course social unrest leads first to chaos and then to dictatorship. I mean, I think that 
the, the prospect of some kind of dictatorship, either military or communistic, I think in most cases more likely military, uh, it seems to me very great within the next uh, 15 to 20 years. And whether some of these dictatorships may make use of these uh, modern methods remains to be seen. But I think that unhappily the, uh, the prospects for dictatorships in large areas of the world seem to me very great at the moment. I, I, I think that there is a considerable likelihood of this thing happening. The implication seems to be <clears throat> that um, we ought to be apprehensive that these techniques fall into the hands of dictatorships, demigods, etc. But I could uh, easily envisage a situation where Western democracies could use these uh, methods, such as electrodes attached to the brain of, SAC Air, uh, of the SAC in order to avoid accidental war. This could be uh, put in very moral terms. Or that uh, you give soma to the discontented minority of the population who are suffering from uh, anomie, etc. Would you care to comment about the use of uh, the use of these techniques by democracy, by democratic states? Well, you're a lot more pessimistic than I am, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe your pessimism is justified. I, I don't. I mean, uh, this is the. Uh, the awful fact remains that when techniques have been discovered, sooner or later they tend to be applied. And uh, <laughs> uh, in these uh, techniques, which uh, where the object of application uh, is the human being, you're obviously up against uh, the most uh, dangerous situation. And, and what will be the temptation uh, for those in power? I mean, after all, we pray regularly not to be led into temptation, and this is a very profound and important prayer. I mean, experience sadly shows that if we are tempted long enough and strongly enough, we almost invariably succumb, and that the, the whole uh, process of uh, setting up a decent society is essentially setting up a society in which temptations to abuse power and, uh, shall be reduced to a minimum. But uh, these uh, new techniques, I, I think, do uh, constitute a series of uh, very powerful uh, temptations, uh, which to those in authority may be to finally turn out to be irresistible. I hope not, but uh, I think what you say is, uh, uh, is something which we have to think about. I mean, that uh, this might uh, be... Uh, applied with justification, as you say, in the highest patriotic and moral terms, uh, even in uh, democratic societies. I trust not, but, uh, but one never knows, uh, particularly under conditions of extreme uh, military stress. It would appear, sir, that the type of dictatorship which you have outlined for us here today and uh, more detail in the Brave New World would uh, tend to be self-perpetuating unless there's a rise such a sharp social crisis as to disrupt the pattern of authority mm. and break the, the hold which is being passed on from one generation to the other in these terms. Uh, but it would appear that the type of, of social crisis involved in large-scale warfare, whether it be nuclear warfare or otherwise, or the type of crisis involved in a widespread famine, etc., uh, would tend to disrupt this pattern of dictatorship. Mm. Therefore, would you say that it's necessary to have a high degree of social stability in terms of economic conditions, in terms of world peace, before a dictatorship of the sort you have described for us would be able to really imprint itself upon a population? This, I think, is very important. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's obvious that such a dictatorship, if it were going to survive, would have to guarantee the uh, adequate food supplies. I mean, uh, uh, I, I think... Uh, and whether it could, in fact, do this uh, while the the kind of, of international tensions, whether it could, whether we can expect a long-lasting dictatorship uh, within the context of nationalism, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think we can expect dictatorships to arise, but not long-lasting ones. I mean, I think that even the best organized dictatorship within the context of nationalism uh, is likely, as you say, to, to lead to 
to break itself down because one side of the paranoid uh, state of mind will lead it into conflict uh, and um, which will, of course, destroy it, uh, finally destroy it. I mean, th this is a, is a very important point. And then, of course, another point which was made by Sir Charles Darwin in his book, The Next Million Years, which I think um, was one which, uh, with, uh, in different terms, I envisaged in Brave New World. I mean, he, uh, he points out that uh, the human species is still a wild species. It has never been domesticated. I mean, a, a domesticated species is one which has been tamed by another species. Well, uh, until we get an invasion from Mars, we shall not be tamed by another species. All we can do is to try to tame ourselves, that an oligarchy tries to tame ourselves, but the oligarchy still remains wild. I mean, however much it succeeded in taming the domesticating the rest of the race, it rem must remain wild. And this was the part of the uh, fable, the dramatic part of the fable of uh, Brave New World, is that the people in the upper hierarchy who were not uh, ruthlessly conditioned uh, could break down. And, uh, I mean, this... Uh, uh, Charles Darwin insists that uh, because man is wild, he can never expect to uh, to domesticate himself because the people on top will always be undomesticated and will sooner or later always run wild. Well, I, I think there's a good deal to be said for this uh, uh, this point of view in, in, in regard to the permanence of any dictatorship. Um, yes, I have a question. Uh, I'm worried about a relationship that seems to exist between cost, consent, and control. Mm. If a government wants to control its people, of course, its job will be easier if they are more willing to consent, and the job will be correspondingly more costly if the corresponding mm. consent isn't there. Uh, could you make a few remarks about the economic feasibility of introducing biological controls of the sort you talk about? I, I don't know. I mean, wouldn't it, uh, I would have thought in some ways it would be cheaper than maintaining very large uh, security forces and concentration camps and so on. Uh, that, uh, I mean, just as uh, in asylums, uh, chemical control is a great deal simpler and cheaper than physical control. I mean, the, the bad old days of straight jackets and uh, manacles and so on required quite a lot of uh, of of people to handle the insane, whereas uh, the tranquilizers uh, seem to require much, much fewer. I mean, that you can you can get uh, equal results uh, with uh, simpler and certainly pleasanter means. Uh, I have no idea about the uh, the actual cost situation, but I, I, it seems to me that it might actually be cheaper. I don't know. Well, I see that some of you are leaving for your four o'clock classes. I will give you an opportunity to leave now. If uh, Mr. Huxley would be willing, we might be able to entertain some questions from the floor for a few moments. Would you, sir? Certainly, yes. Uh, will those of you who are obliged to leave now uh, please stand? I apologize having gone on so long. No, no, that's mm. fine. I'm sure I much prefer to hear you discuss these questions, but I think we might be able to show up. I hope you're not finding it. It's uncomfortably warm in here. Well, it's I getting know. a little warm, isn't it? There seems to be a completely windowless hall, isn't it? This is part of the conditioning process, I'm sure. Oh. Is there any means of ventilation in this hall? I see one door there. Next Tuesday at 2. Next Tuesday at 2. I think there is ventilation. The ventilation never seems to be able to meet the best. Well, uh, no, they were mainly discussing, uh, I mean, there was a lot about uh, the, the problem of bringing technology to the underdeveloped countries. They had a lot of people from the United Nations there, a very able man, uh, 
uh, was a Vietnamese called uh, uh, Vu Van Thai. Uh, charming man. He was, uh, spoke English with a strong French accent because he'd learned his economics in Paris. And uh, he was very interesting. I mean, he said, I I'm speaking to you like a rat with electrodes in my brain because I speak from the inside. I'm not one of the experimenters on the outside. So, and he was, he was very interesting about it. I mean, about the, the, the difficulty that when you do introduce, say, one area of highly evolved technique into one of these backward countries, you create an enormous gap between the people who run this thing and profit by it and the mass of the population. I mean, a gap which is just as serious as the gap between the uh, have-nots and underdeveloped nations as a whole and those who, uh, and the haves and the developed. And uh, he, his say, what he was saying was that you must have a, an adaptation of technique which shall be suitable to these people and not try to bring in what you have already. But he says very little work has been done in this field. There were a number of, I mean, there was several very able people. Richard Calder at the University of Edinburgh was there and, and uh, Arthur Goldschmidt who is the director of the um, special services in the United Nations. And we had some extremely good uh, talks. Mm. But I have one question here which is uh, well this is essentially the question which Mr. Huxley addressed himself to in his last time is that how will control over the techniques been transmitted from uh, one group to another? App apparently referring to how to the control of the techniques be uh, transmitted uh, from one elite, one generation elite to, to another. Would you wish to comment further on this question? I know you did just speak to it just before. Um, well, I don't think so. I mean, I, I do think there will clearly be a difficulty. I mean, there, there is always a difficulty in transferring power. I mean, well, after all, the, hence the uh, constitutions, uh, uh, written constitutions such as the United States, or a hereditary monarchy which, uh, in which uh, you got uh, uh, de facto power being de jure and the, the possibility of uh, passing power on without uh, much hitch from one generation to another. It may be that in a thoroughly well-controlled dictatorship, the problem of of power at the top, the struggle for power would not take place. But even there, I mean, simply because, again, because the the oligarchy is itself not subjected to the extremes of conditioning, because it must retain a certain freedom in order to uh, to be able to make uh, adequate decisions. That, uh, that maybe the struggle for power would always remain a, a great problem, as it has been. Uh, throughout history, except where you have uh, had written constitutions or acceptable monarchies. Yes? Well, Dr. Huxley, to adhere to the view of the comment, I'm going to do that precisely the American society of Western democracy has been so particularly susceptible to this type of way of the world for the following reason that uh, the society is conditioned here, a great uh, degree of social conformity. Mm. But in your period of stress, uh, this idea of conformity is further pushed, and uh, consequently, it makes it much easier to develop these techniques. And that, uh, it seems that politically, the extremities, uh, there's a growing feeling that we have to do away with the extremities, we have to keep on going the central path. Mm. And this would seem to me to make this much easier for a uh, type of dictatorship that you said to slowly, using the mass media that we're developing, uh, mold the population, plus the factor that in some of the other uh, type societies, you have less inhibition about the brutal uh, struggle for power within the top hierarchy, whereas here, there would be some type of a, uh, inhibition due to the so-called legal process that has developed, which would keep men from then violently attacking the leaders. Um. Well, the, the, uh, this business about uh, conformity, uh, I, I just don't know. It's, it seems extremely difficult, uh, certainly for me, to judge whether there is a, a higher degree of conformity 
uh, here and now than there has been in other places and in the past. Uh, I mean, I would have thought the, the tendency towards conformity was to some extent offset by the enormous uh, differentiation of function in a modern society. I mean that nothing could be less uh, homogeneous in function than a complex uh, modern society. I mean, people are doing extraordinarily different things. And uh, although there may be a pressure to conformity uh, in, the, uh, in the suburbs, so to speak, at home, there does seem a considerable pressure to non-conformity or to differentiation in the functional life of people. I mean, I have no idea to what extent one offsets the other and whether the, the conforming drive is stronger than the, the drive towards differentiation. I just don't, don't know what the answer to this. I mean, the, uh, I read about the high degree of conformity, and of course one does see that uh, certainly as compared with the 19th century, this society does seem to be more conformist. I mean, if one reads the history of the, of the utopian colonies which were set up during the 19th century, uh, this, this is really extravagant. I mean, that it's inconceivable to think of anything like the Oneida community or Brook Farm even uh, being set up today, I mean, that uh, this would be uh, so outrageous uh, that uh, uh, it would be impossible to imagine. And yet, uh, in uh, these Victorian days, uh, there was this uh, freedom to, uh, to make experiments, social experiments, of the wildest character. Uh, again, uh, exactly what this means and exactly... Uh, what the significance is for, for us and for the future, I don't, I don't really know. I, I mean, uh, I don't, just feel so incapable of really understanding the, the uh, unutterably odd facts of, of real life. I mean, I think one very often just has to accept them. There they are, and what really they mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, perhaps this is one of the charms of history that... Uh, one never really knows what it uh, what it means. Does a gentleman matter? Uh, if you have always been interested in religious ideas, including mysticism, there are certain uh, problems and implications arising out of the use of artificial means and human beings. Well, this, uh, I mean, um, this is finally related to the whole mind-body problem. I mean, what, uh, uh, we still don't know very much about uh, the relation of mind and body. I mean, I mean, we know clearly that they're related to one another very closely, but exactly how electrochemical events in the central nervous system uh, turn into the G minor quartet of Mozart, we really haven't the faintest idea. I mean, I don't think we have any more idea than uh, Aquinas or Aristotle. I mean, all we can say is that it happens. Uh, and we do know a good deal more about the nature of the electrical and the chemical events. Uh, but uh, again, what the bridge is, and uh, whether it's enough to say, uh, like the neutral monists, that... Uh, the two aspects, the mental and the physical, are merely the same thing seen from different sides. Again, I don't know. I mean, even then, I mean, how can the same thing look so profoundly different? Something I, I don't understand. And in relation to the, the mystical experience, I mean, clearly the, uh, this is correlated with uh, uh, electrochemical states within the... Uh, within the central nervous system, and uh, I would be all for studying these states. I mean, I think it's, it's exceedingly important that we should know uh, about it. I mean, I can imagine a whole branch of science which would be called uh, neurotheology or, or mycomysticism. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, this sounds funny, but nevertheless, it's uh, we have to 
be able to speak in uh, the same kind of language about the two, uh, the two aspects of any of these experiences, the, the, the neurological and the subjective. And then we, uh, I suppose, on the philosophical level, we have to make the decision which uh, uh, Henry uh, William James posed for us. I mean, he says perfectly obvious that uh, that a mind uh, is a function of the nervous system, but is it a productive function or is it a transmissive function? I mean, it does, as Cabanis said at the beginning of the 19th century, does the brain secrete thought as the liver secretes bile? Or is it some kind of valve, as, uh, as James himself, I think, thought, and as certainly as Bergson thought, uh, through which a pre-existent uh, mental uh, element finds access into the human being? I mean, Bergson's view was that, of course, it was, it was a kind of reducing valve which... Uh, permitted only those aspects of the universal consciousness which were useful to our survival as animals on the surface of the planet and as social creatures within a society uh, to come through. Uh, I, I don't know. As James says, the, uh, the both points of view are quite difficult from a philosophical point of view to, uh, to justify, but the uh, the the transmissive view is no more difficult than the productive view. And I, perhaps he's right. I think my own view is that, on the whole, that he and Bergson were nearer the truth than the Cabanis, but I don't know. This gentleman in the white shirt, though. Dr. Huxley, would you care to comment on uh, Sir Julian Huxley's uh, views on artificial insemination donation? Well, I, I don't know that I know his views exactly. <laughs> I just want to. You care to clarify that mm. for us? Yeah. I, I think he favors, along with a Dr. Herman Muller of uh, mm. Indiana University oh, yes. here in the United States, mm. I think that uh, genetic, we can genetically improve uh, the human race by adopting amongst uh, the population uh, are, are the practice of artificial insemination using the, uh, the sperm of, uh, of in intelligent individuals. And I don't know how he determines that these individuals are to be chosen, but I, I was just wondering if you were familiar with... Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, this is, of course, the whole problem of eugenics. I mean, if one knew how to apply eugenic principles, I think unquestionably one uh, could improve the, uh, the average quality of the human race. And I mean, there is some evidence, as Bert uh, pointed out a long time ago, and as uh, Medawa has pointed out more recently, uh, that uh, there is uh, some evidence that there is a slight decline of... Uh, average IQ, uh, and this certainly could be remedied. But of course, as you say, the problem is to choose uh, who. I mean, I, one can, uh, I can perfectly imagine that if the Cold War goes on for a very long time, that side which first uh, uh, starts uh, artificial insemination for the production of people with greater talent in the physical sciences will win. Uh, <laughs> And I read a paper the other day by, I forget who, a biologist at the University of California at Santa Barbara. It was an amusing paper, but I mean, it had quite interesting and serious aspects to it on a sort of a hypothetical Cold War action on the part of the dictatorial powers who were able to make use of eugenics in ways which would not, as this uh, author whose name I cannot now remember, in ways uh, which uh, were not um, necessarily very tyrannical, because if the, sure the, the woman would be uh, allowed to marry whomever she liked, but uh, provided she had the children by selected uh, um, fathers outside the, the relationship, so that, I mean, there would be the, the actual personal relationships between husband and wife would not be modified seriously, but, I mean, this, as I say, was a, 
was a fantasy, but it, it, again, it looked like a fantasy which uh, uh, could quite likely come true and uh, could, uh, as uh, the geneticists, I think, are all agreed, uh, could certainly lead to considerable results. Of course, on a, for eugenics to take place on any uh, in a rapid way, you would have to be able to control the you know, not merely the male genetic factors, but the female, which is, of course, much more difficult, but not impossible, I imagine. I have one written question here I'd like to read out to you, sir. Now, the population explosion is a grave danger to mankind, yet the right to bear children is a right of free will. The only apparent way to stem this explosion is by some large-scale kind of conditioning or external coercion, yet this is also a grave danger. Is there any way out of this dilemma? <laughs> well, the way out of the dilemma surely has been pointed out in, in most countries of the, of the West where people voluntarily have uh, limited the size of their families. I mean, this has happened without any coercion unless you call the desire to uh, have a good economic life and to bring up your children well a coercion. But, I mean, this has in fact occurred. Uh, and, uh, I mean, in this country, uh, after having reached a low during the Depression, the birth rate happens to have gone up. But, I mean, the point is that the, the control of the size of families is now completely voluntary here, I mean, or more or less completely voluntary, and which makes it profoundly different from the, um, the people in the underdeveloped societies who are still going on producing ten children because the, the, the habit uh, persists that in order to for three children to survive, you have to produce ten. But now if you produce ten children, seven survive because of elementary public health uh, uh, precautions which have been brought in. Uh, hence, of course, the, uh, the enormous inc sudden increase, the, 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 the death rate which used to be in the upper 30s as was the birth rate, has now fallen in many of these countries to 15 and 12 and even 10. So naturally there's an enormous increase. Uh, but uh, it's certainly going to take uh, some time to get people uh, to change their habits. I mean, uh, psychological inertia is, is much more powerful than physical inertia. I mean, it's much easier to push a 10-ton truck than a human being. Mr. Post has one further question uh, here. You've spoken of the ends to which drugs should not be devoted, uh, such as increasing conformity, mm. making men more content with what is actually an intolerable situation, securing the power of a small elite, and so on. Uh, to what ends do you think these drugs should be devoted, granted that we have them? Well, I mean, uh, I think the, the therapeutically some of them are very valuable. I think already, for example... Uh, some of the so-called psychic energizers have done a great deal in the mental field. I mean, they, I understand from Dr. Nathan Klein, for example, that uh, in very many cases you can use some of these psychic energizers instead of the electric uh, electroshock therapy. Uh, and people say that electroshock therapy doesn't do any harm, but I cannot believe that partial electrocution is good for anybody. Uh, <laughs> And it seems to me a very good thing that if you, you can get people on a, a maintenance dose to get them out of these uh, these awful catatonic and uh, depressed conditions, which you seem to be able to do. And uh, therefore, there are many people, it seems to me, outside institutions who, who uh, have tendencies in the same direction, which uh, I think a, a genuine psychic energizer might be... A, which could be used without harm to people would be of immense value. There was even, it was stated a few years ago, I remember, that the Russians had a five-year plan for increasing mental efficiency by chemical means. I don't know whether this has gone on and what they've discovered, but its I would think it's probably on the cards that you could increase the span of attention, the, the amount of time you could... Uh, concentrate on things, the, uh, the power of observation and so on, by chemical as well as by educational means. I mean, I think that there are a, a number of probably quite good things you could, 
could do. And then, again, in the case of these very strange substances like psilocybin and lysergic acid, I think there's a great deal to be said for, for doing what uh, William James talked about, for getting people to realize that the their ordinary sort of common sense view of the world is not the only view that the, the universe they inhabit is not the only possible universe. There are other very strange universes which some people spontaneously inhabit. I mean, a man like William Blake obviously inhabits an extremely different universe from uh, that which most people inhabit. And I, I think it's probably very uh, wholesome for people to uh, to be permitted to realize this fact, to perceive that the, uh, the world of the mind is immensely large and that there are these very strange and extraordinary areas in them. And, uh, and there are plenty of cases in the literature where the, these kind of experiences have produced a kind of conversion. Um, the work which is being done at Harvard now by Leary in the prison, uh, in the local prisons in Boston, the, very interesting, a sort of a series of, of extraordinary conversion experiences among hardened criminals have, have emerged from this. And here again, there may be, I mean, we don't know enough about the subject yet, but uh, there may be um, possibilities of very great importance here of, of sort of removing obstacles. I mean, the the justification it was, uh, was stated by Bergson years ago when he was defending William James against uh, his use of nitrous oxide. Uh, a number of fellow philosophers thought this was infradig that a, a eminent philosopher should resort to these chemical means, uh, which enabled, I mean, James remarked that uh, only under nitrous oxide could he understand what Hegel meant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bergson said that uh, it must be realized that uh, the experiences which uh, Mr. James described are not caused by the gas. The gas is merely the occasion. The gas is removed certain obstacles, which might have been removed equally well by psychological or psychophysical means, the so-called spiritual exercises of the various religions, uh, but uh, can also be removed by these chemical means. And that if you can do so without doing harm to yourself, so much the better. And incidentally, um, it's one of the great uh, uh, tragedies, I think, in, in psychological research that uh, the James, I think in about 1905, uh, uh, made an experiment with peyote. Uh, and as he had a rather weak stomach, all that he got was violent vomiting. He says, I'm afraid I must take the visions for granted. I got only the nausea. And it's, a, it's an awful pity if he'd had a stronger stomach, we should have had this research beginning 50 years ago. But uh, his weak stomach prevented this, and we've had to wait till much later to get this thing really going. Well, before we close the program... Uh... Mrs. Lane, the Graduate Student Association, asked me to announce that there will be a meeting of the Graduate Student Association next Tuesday at noon. And I want to express our appreciation to Mr. Huxley on behalf of all of those who are uh, fearful lest our augmented knowledge restrict our understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you.